this car. This car is great. This is what the future used to look like. Now, before we decided it would be a great idea if we used no fuel at all, the plan was to use as little fuel as possible. And these three cars were at the forefront of doing that. It's the original Toyota Prius, the original Honda Insight, and the most extreme and certainly the most exotic, Volkswagen's XL1. They all have a petrol engine or a diesel engine, and they also have an electric motor. They are hybrids of the first order. But what did they teach us and how do they stack up today? Okay, so let's start in the Prius because, well, it's the earliest of the three cars we've got here. And when it came out in 1997, having a internally combusted electric hybrid wasn't a brand new idea. I mean, it was a century old idea, effectively. But it was sufficiently unusual that Toyota was worried people would not easily and readily accept it. So it did a few things to mitigate that. It introduced a five-year warranty. It introduced a leasing scheme that guaranteed the future residual value, and it also took on the responsibility for a lot of recycling because it's got a nickel metal hydride battery of you know, reasonable capacity. And Toyota said, look, we'll deal with the recycling of that. And it also, to make it feel not too weird, put it in this body, which is reasonably aerodynamically efficient for a passenger car of the time, but still, it's a four-door, five-seat family car. Toyota wanted the hybrid to feel normal. And by and large, it does. It feels like any other automatic car. Now, quite often people say that this car is a CVT. Now, that's a continuously variable transmission. Technically, that's kind of accurate because it is continuously variable, but it is not a CVT in the accepted sense that they're just an automatic gearbox with belts and pulleys instead of actual gears. This is far more sophisticated, technically far more simple, but far more sophisticated than that. So the way it works is that there is an internal combustion engine, and I will just call that an engine for the purposes of this video in future. Anything internally combusted, I'm just going to call an engine, and an electric motor, I am just going to call a motor. So if I was testing some big brutish American V8, I might sometimes refer to that engine as a motor. I'm not going to do that today. If I say engine, I mean internal combustion. If I say motor, I mean motor. The Prius has an engine and two motor generators, so two electric motors, and they are joined to the wheels by a brilliantly sophisticated planetary gear set. And each of those things, engine motor one, motor two, is attached to a different part of it, which is then attached to the driven wheels. And what that means, there'll be a graphic on screen, which I hope demonstrates it a bit better than you can in words. You, it's the kind of thing you have to see. What that means is that any of those elements can operate at a certain given speed that you want it to. For example, if you want the engine to be completely stationary, you can. If you want one of the motors to be completely stationary, you can. And the other one, the other motor generator, picks up the slack so that it, the overall system matches the speed of the road wheels. Make sense? Now, it's very hard to explain, but actually when you see it, you go, ah, yes. I get it. It's a very straightforward system, it's a really clever system, and it's also an incredibly reliable system. So there was a time when, I mean as you'll know, Toyotas are pretty reliable cars anyway, there was a time when the Prius had the lowest number of warranty claims of any Toyota, and this hybrid system had the lowest number of warranty claims on a Prius. So it was the most reliable part of the most reliable car from one of the most reliable car companies. It is exceptional. But more than that, when we talk about a full hybrid today, it is this that we're talking about. It's the ability for that internally combusted engine to do nothing. That's the key to it, is you can remove the engine from the whole thing and run just on battery power. And whether you plug in the car or not, Toyota gets itself into some trouble by calling some of its hybrids self-charging, which is a slightly misleading, I'll grant you. Whether you plug the cars in or whether you don't plug them in at all, they are more efficient than just having an internally combusted engine. Get into a brand new Toyota Yaris, car of the year 2021, and you will find that its hybrid system allows it to do 
70 to the gallon pretty easily and for a car that you don't plug in at all that really is an impressive feat. So I don't think the Prius is the kind of car that you would say has ever been a car enthusiast's car but it's come quite a long way from the time when it was bought by people who wanted to wanted to virtue signal more than anything else. It's, it has become part of motoring mainstream and anything that describes itself as a full hybrid these days where the engine can be completely removed from the process owes a debt of gratitude to the fact that we got used to cars doing that thanks to the Toyota Prius. And from that point of view it really is a landmark car. Probably more so I would say than the Honda Insight but let's go and leap in it and I'll explain why what goes on between its engine and its driven wheels it's not quite as sophisticated as what happens here. So while the Toyota Prius tried to make hybridization popular and normal for the masses, this, the first generation Honda Insight, was deliberately weird. Now, partly that's the way it looked because it's hugely aerodynamic and there are two things that are important when it comes to aerodynamics. One is what they call the drag coefficient and that's how slippery a shape actually is. The second thing is the frontal area, which is how much of that shape is presented to the wind as you go through it. And when you multiply those two things together, you get an overall drag. So a Volkswagen Microbus, the Type 2, the big bus, that had a better drag coefficient, 0.44, than a Jaguar D-Type racing car, 0.49. But of course, the Jaguar was much smaller, so more aerodynamic overall. The Insight is brilliant at both. It has a very small frontal area. Most cars are over two meters, two square meters. This was like 1.89 square meters. So it's very small, only has two seats and it tapers towards the back. And then its drag coefficient was only 0.25, which was probably the best of any production car at the time. So it has a very lightweight aluminium monocoque. The whole car only weighs a little over 835 kilograms. And as you'll notice, as you get towards the back, it is actually narrower. The rear track is narrower. The body is narrower, which is why there are no seats back there than it is at the front. And it has these fenders over the rear wheels to keep the airflow laminar all the way towards the back. Now, the ideal aerodynamic shape is a teardrop. Now, it's hard to get in a car because obviously you've got the road and everything else. The worst aerodynamic shape you can have is a flat plate. So what the Honda has tried to do is make this, this teardroppy as it can, as it gets towards the rear of the car, and then it's just cut it off at the back because actually a conventional hatchback shape isn't that good. And you'll know that conventional hatches sometimes have a spoiler to stop you getting turbulent air all over the rear window. But it's the aero rather than the drivetrain which makes this car so efficient. But we'll come to the drivetrain as we go for a spin. And so to how the Honda Insight drives. I love this interior. It's really uh, clean and pure and it's got quite a lot of luggage space because there is nothing, no space for the passengers back there. It would, I suspect, feel a slightly cramped cabin, but when we come to the XL1, I suspect that will feel another level again. It's weird to have a manual gearbox in a car like this, isn't it? I think there is a one litre internally combusted engine in the front which makes around 67 horsepower. And then there is the electric motor for that as well. It's geared really long, really long. I mean, you pull away in first gear and you think, crikey, I could be in second or third quite easily. This is, it's fair to say, a more interesting car to drive than the Prius, which was shop's own brand, white bread form of driving. Just, just plain, just nothing about it. This has got a bit more about it. It's not terribly comfortable. The ride is pretty firm and shaky, but the steering is accurate. It, it makes it respond. And the fact that there's a manual gearbox gives you a bit more to do as well. Although it's not a powerful car by any stretch, I get this little thing nipping over to the assist side of a, of a chart when you accelerate and you get a little bit of electric assistance as you put your foot down to make it nippy enough. And on a motorway, while you think actually I'll shift down to fourth or even third because the gearing is long enough to allow it. It does get to and maintain a speed quite easily owing to the fact that it's so small and so aerodynamically efficient. Where it's not as clever as the Prius is, well, between here and the front wheels. The Insight has a system which was called integrated motor assist and it puts the electric motor between the engine and around the flywheel and clutch point of view. Now it can drive 
without the engine driving as well, if you like. You can shut off the fuel to the engine, but it sits the engine side of the clutch, hence you can have a manual gearbox, which means that although the motor can assist, and it can if you want, produce all the power, the engine is spinning all the time that you're connecting the front wheels to the clutch of the drivetrain, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? What I mean is, even if the, mo the motor is driving you and the engine is off and receiving no fuel, it's still turning over all the time that the clutch is engaged and the wheels are rolling, which means you get those losses and that drag on it. So it is not as effective as a full hybrid system. But you throw in all the other things together, the compactness, the aerodynamic efficiency, the really leggy gearing, and what you end up with a car, what you end up with is a car that can do and does do in, in a lot of people's driving about 100 miles to the gallon. These cars were not cheap when they were new, they're relatively affordable now. You can buy a really tidy used one for like five or six grand and somebody will go and replenish and refresh the batteries if you want to. This car's got about 60,000 miles on it and it is quite old so I suspect the batteries are not in tip-top form. But what I'm intrigued by really is to see how the Volkswagen XL1 takes what makes this car special and moves it on to another extreme entirely. Now if you take all of that compactness and aero efficiency of the Honda Insight and you take it to a massive extreme, you end up with this, which is the Volkswagen XL1, which came about at a time when, you might remember, Ferdinand Pieck was in charge of the Volkswagen Group and he did not do things by halves. So, for example, it decided that Volkswagen should have a luxury car, even though it already owned Audi and Bentley, and they created the Phaeton, built it in its own bespoke glass factory, didn't make any money, but was a very cool car. Well, think of this as a similar sort of thing. It started off life being what they called the one litre car, one litres of fuel per 100 kilometres, which is about 282 miles to the gallon. And by the time the XL1 went into production in 2011, this was a car that was claimed to run at 313 miles to the gallon, owing to its incredible efficiency and also its compactness. It is tiny. The frontal area, and we talked about aerodynamics, earlier, the frontal area is just one and a half square metres and the overall drag coefficient is like 0 0.186, which was, probably still remains, a production car record. It is minuscule. It's a tiny bit shorter than a polo of the time, a little bit narrower, but a full foot closer to the ground and it is beautifully constructed from carbon fibre, just like a supercar. And just like a supercar, if you like a McLaren, you know, a lot of strength is in the sills, so to be able to get in easily in and out you need a gullwing door it's really cool and the driver and passenger sit offset so that they can get in it together so narrow is it so given it's so low to the ground if you put the motor in the front you'd never see anything so instead this two cylinder 800 cc diesel effectively half of volkswagen's 1.6 litre diesel at the time lives here there is also electrical assistance there's a five and a half kilowatt hour battery at the front you can you don't have to plug it in to get even more efficiency out of it now what I love about this car is you can see all of this carbon fibre and this engineering and the compact packaging and everything. It's just beautifully put together. But what I've never done is spent any time with it. This is the first time I've ever spent any time with one of these cars. So I'm really excited to try it because they're just so rare. They made 250, they cost 100 grand. But people tell me they're actually fairly conventional to drive with a normal dashboard and layout and just feels like any other Volkswagen. So let's find out. And yeah, in terms of interior ergonomics, this does feel like a Volkswagen. I've got a very VWS switch gear. It could have come out of a, an up or a polo or something. A, a dead straight driving position with a you know, VW badged steering wheel in front of me. But that is where the sort of things you know and accept from Volkswagens end. But the roof is incredibly tight and close to me. The steering wheel is small really small and also the steering is unassisted because adding power assistance would have added too much weight to a car that is only what 795 kilos all in this was the first car to get cameras production car to get cameras instead of mirrors as i understand it they are not brilliant and of course because of where the engine is there's no rear view mirror 
to get visibility otherwise. The view out is quite supercarish in a way. And I'm told that Volkswagen resisted the urge to put finishing on the A-pillars because it would have increased their size by three millimeters. So they just wanted to maximize whatever view out you could get. And it's cool. It's really cool. I don't know if you, I don't know how much you can hear of that engine. It just rattles along like, I don't know, a canal boat motor or a compressor or something like that. It's weird. But anyway, it's driving through a twin clutch gearbox, but actually there are three clutches because the engine is clutched as well. So you can clutch out the engine. So unlike the Insight where it's always turning over, you can actually just disconnect the engine completely and just be driven on the motor alone. It's a weird old car. The front tyres are really narrow. They're like 115 section, something like that. And it rolls along firmly and noisily, as a lot of carbon fibre constructed supercars are. If you drive, if you drive a McLaren uh, on the concrete stretch of the M25 motorway, oh my god, um, it's um, it's they're so echoey. And this has a similar sort of rigid, echoey feel to it. The ride is is very firm, but okay. And when the engine cuts out, and you just have that to just drive along with, it's quite a cool thing. It's a, it's a lovely thing. It's a really lovely thing. They are rare. They are difficult to look after. They have to go back. Certainly in the UK, they have to go back to the UK importer. I think the service intervals are like 3,000 miles or something like that. So it's a hard car to look after. And it's also... A strange car to be in to be so low to be so close to a passenger if you had one and if it if I said it felt like anything at all in the way it's colored and in the way that it's unassisted don't take this the wrong way Volkswagen but it almost feels like a Sinclair C5 that little three-wheel plastic thing that my granddad had one in the 80s because he invented something similar in the 50s and thought Sir Clive Sinclair had nicked his idea so he bought one and had put it on its end to take it into his flat in his sheltered accommodation. But when we adopted it from him when he couldn't look after it anymore, it was a giggle. And this has a not dissimilar feel to it in that it's very light, it's very low, it's very compact and when that engine cuts out, let's put it in EV mode if I can, if there's enough battery juice, I'm not sure there is. But when that motor cuts, that when that engine cuts out and you've just got the motors alone, just get the whoosh. It's a right. It's so cool. It is so cool. I absolutely adore this car. It's really brilliant. What a tremendously brilliant thing. What a what a fabulous fabulous thing. I'm told because this car is limited to 99 miles an hour, and I read that if it wasn't, it would do about 125 miles an hour which is impressive given that the 800cc diesel makes 50 horsepower and the motor adds another 27 to that. So it does not have a lot of hope. But even so, like some old Le Mans streamliners or something, it'll still do a respectable top speed. So 125 miles an hour on that power output, less than 80 horsepower. It's pretty remarkable. And if it were fitted, so our report at the time said, if it were fitted with a conventional two litre diesel engine, which would at the time, 2011, 2012, have been, what, 150 horsepower, I suppose? It would be capable, with that amount of power, this car would be capable of 200 miles an hour, which, which would be sensational. Imagine getting onto an autobahn in a car like this and knowing if you just stayed on it, you'd do 200 miles an hour. You can still find that first drive if you subscribe to our digital publication. You get the full access to Autocar's back catalogue of the last decade or so from our 126 years, but we're also at autocar.co.uk. And if you like and subscribe to this channel, you will never miss one of our reviews or video features, etc., etc. And honestly, we'd be very grateful. We do loads. We do loads. Autocar does loads and loads and loads of content. Most of it is free and I recommend it to you. Anyway, on with the rest of the car review. It's exquisite, it's lovely, it's like a little jewel. It is, I mean, it's 
brilliant. What I absolutely adore about this car is that it puts that sort of level of exquisite finish and engineering detail on display to you just in the same way that a, that a, that a brilliantly finished supercar does. But instead of power and noise and speed, it's just all about efficiency. And it's sad to think that at the same time Volkswagen was doing this car, all of the engineering brilliance and nows that went into this, it was also telling you that its diesel cars would emit fewer emissions than they actually were. What a shame that those two things were operating pretty much at the same time. Really, real, whatever. Come on, yes. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that because you had the ability to do this. And in terms of what could have been, this car has been driven down here today. It's done 50, 60 miles at very normal speeds. And it has done 115 miles to the gallon. And that's without any semblance of plugging in at all in a 10 year old piece of technology. What we've lost in not making cars like this, which are unbelievably aerodynamically efficient, People could have just gone, yeah, this is fantastic. We all want a really aerodynamically efficient car. As it is, manufacturers started making very efficient powertrains, full of hybrids, a bit like the Priuses that can switch the engine out at any given time you like. But because we've all bought SUVs, we have literally undone every single piece of advancement when it comes to making combustion engines more efficient. And there is a bit of a shame in that, I think. And now not all cars can be like the XL1. Not all cars can be carbon fibre and so narrow that you have to be on very good terms with your passenger. But it is a bit of a shame that when it comes to creating as much efficiency as possible, we don't make the most of aerodynamics because we just want cars that are so big. And ultimately then, the Prius of the three has become the most influential of all those cars just because of the way its drivetrain was configured. But give me the choice of taking one away to cherish and love forever, it will be this, because this is absolutely lovely. I love this car a bit. Thanks for joining us for this slightly unusual feature. There are better words on the XL1 at Friends, they're not by me, in the magazine, which is on sale every Wednesday. We are also at autocar.co.uk all the time, and we're on YouTube at least once a week with news, reviews, the odd drag race track battle, or will it drift? See you next time. Mm -hmm.